Shepherd's Chapel, welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get into our Father's Word? Zechariah, remembered of Yah. In other words, that period of time, a seven-year period is the amount of time that Zechariah spans his uh, ministry. And I feel strongly that it symbolizes the last seven years or supposedly that span of time that has been shortened. And it tells you how it's going down so that you're not fooled, you're not de uh, deceived, you're not surprised. So you want to pay real close attention. In the last chapter, in the chapter before, you were told and instructed that if you feel you lack knowledge or information, that is to say the latter rain, that would be the verse uh, 1 of 10, ask for it. Ask who? Ask God. If God must touch your mind to enlarge uh, the field of recovery and information as you cover his letter, but you have to ask for it. He's not going to just give it to you. It, um, it is simply, uh, at the same time, he doesn't like for anyone to take something they haven't asked for. Do you understand that that's not uh, pr a proper way to bring a child up is to let them take things without asking first. So I wanted to emphasize that I feel it's very important that you show your father, your heavenly father, respect enough that in as much as all wisdom comes from him, that you at least have the courtesy to ask him for that wisdom Otherwise, you're liable to get all puffed up and think you have all wisdom and it flows from you. You might think you know everything. And I assure you, you will have a sad day approaching you if you come to that conclusion. We're just beginning to understand knowledge and our Father is blessed. He told us in the 11th chapter as to how a false shepherd, as a matter of fact, it would even be one that was worshiped, meaning Antichrist, would appear on this earth before the true Christ returns. It was fascinating. Now let's pick up the 12th um, uh, chapter. It's a literal prophecy, so stand by. Chapter 12, verse 1, the, uh, that word of wisdom from our Father, we ask him in Yeshua's name. Verse 1 reads, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel. That's the, for the oracle. That is to say a divine uh, declaration, if you would. <clears throat> and it will come to pass as it's written. Saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth. He did that. Your father did. Think about it. You know what else he has done? and formeth the spirit of man within him. What does it mean, within him? After the conception. And at the conception, God placed that spirit in that entity. That's what he does. And you think he doesn't know you? You think you don't have a personal relationship with him? When he placed your very spirit inside your mother's womb? at the moment of conception? And you think he doesn't know you? Many might say, well, document that. Well, did John not, he leapt in the womb of Elizabeth when on the day that Christ was conceived within Mary? As Mary ran to them, the baby leapt in the womb? Of course, at that time. For the spirit, which in Christ's case was holy, was obvious to John, who was still six months in the womb. So don't ever think that your father doesn't have a very close, personal relationship with you, whether you want it, like it, or, or need it. It's there. That's a fact. Verse 2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. I'm going to hand them a cup of intoxication. It's like a spinning cup, all right, in the Hebrew. Um, meaning, when, uh, and, and first of all, let's, let's fix the place. Now, we're talking about the, as the latter rain picked up in 10. We're talking about the final generation. What Jerusalem are we talking about? What happens in Jerusalem 
in that, uh, those last few years. The Antichrist appears there. The Antichrist sets up operation there. Now, when God specifies Jerusalem as Israel and Judah as Judah, he's talking about true Judah and true Israel, all right? Now, Satan will actually enter the camp as Antichrist and marvel not at that, for Christ himself would say in the first two verses of uh, Matthew chapter 23 that already the scribes and Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses, which is to say the lawgiver, giving the law, making the rules. So what he's saying is if anyone decides they want to conquer true Judah and true Israel, and quite frankly, those that believe in Yeshua Messiah, the branch, or he that was spoken of in verse 12, and he that will be spoken of in chapter 12, the son. Anyone that feels they want to come against them, you can forget it. For it will be as it was written in verse 5 of the 10th chapter, because the Lord is with them when they fight. So you don't have anything to fear or worry about. We have the victory. Verse 3. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. They couldn't win. Now, what this is actually saying, it isn't a stone that's evenly moved like you'd pick a stone up and throw it or a sling stone. It's a stone that is so large you'd get cut and bruised to try to move the thing. I don't care how big you are. It's almost, um, you would probably be better off to consider it an immovable stone. Uh, that uh, anytime you try to move it, you're going to get hurt. And th there's nothing new about that. Anytime you go against God's word, you're going to get hurt. If it's only for correction, for you to get your act together, go back and do your homework and understand if it won't move, that's not God's will. You better do it some other way, whereby he blesses it, and then you know he's in your will. You're in his will, rather. So um, when God is ready to reclaim Jerusalem, as Christ would say in Matthew 24, in that generation, there will be one stone left standing atop another. It's going to be flattened, Antichrist removed, and the millennium area is going to be real nice. Verse 4. In that day, now I want you to think about what day? The Lord's day. A future day. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, panic, all right? And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. In other words, I'm going to watch over my children and when no weapon can be formed against them that I will not crush. And this is to say, who, who was the offspring from um, uh, David, the tribe of Judah? Judah's offspring, so to speak. Christ. Anytime someone goes against Christ, they're just, I'm sorry. You're not going to succeed and you could be uh, skinned up, I'll use that term, something we use in modern day, real bad. Verse 5, and the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. Uh, we, we find our strength in God. You better know that and you better understand it. Verse 6, in that day, Will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood? That's a chafing dish. You know what that is? Handle the hot stuff. And like a torch of fire in a sheaf. You know what a sheaf is? That's a very dry bundle of, uh, let's say, wheat. All right? What, what happens when you put a torch in a dry bundle of uh, wheat, a sheaf? It burns instantly. 
just, I mean, almost instant combustion. Woof, it's gone. It won't do to be the enemy of God at this time. He's telling you the advantage that he will give those that love him. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Meaning when God gathers, as he mentioned in the prior chapter, his children back as they were in the beginning into that area that the tent would be enlarged. Why? To hold those that will be there at that time. The dimensions are, it's huge. And um, our Father intends to make way. Uh, dimensions, of course, coming into this, it's a fantastic time to live. When you see that we have the victory, God double guarantees it. He gives us every advantage that is possible and our, in the elements or weaponry, and our Father understands those things quite re well. Why? Well, that's why in the beginning it told you in verse 1, He made everything anyway, including the universe, the earth, and even was able to place the Spirit in man. Do you know that no one else can do that? Satan can't. You can't. You can't create an embryo and make it live. I don't care whether you try to create a grain of wheat. We, we hear this malarkey about cloning. And it was big news not long ago. Yes, they cloned the sheep. And you know what, Pastor Murray says? I said, I don't believe it. Day one, I do not believe it. Out of three to four hundred tries, something messed up. A ram got in the pen or something. I've been around livestock, and I know my father's word pretty well. It cannot happen. We have natural clones. They're called identical twins, but God creates those. Man can't. So when someone starts talking to you about cloning, let me tell you something. They're puffing smoke, all right? Puffing air been taking their own stuff or something, their own brand. God gives us the victory in his word and in deed. And if you've ever served him, if you've ever really been a servant of his, and when you come up against opposition, especially in this generation, our father knows how to handle it, all right? There are no giants left for God's children. We are the giants when it comes to accomplishing and, and uh, belaying the enemy. Verse 7, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. I, I like this because it says a great deal more. You know, sometimes people make fun of rural people. Um, they think they're poor. Do you know something? We used to pay cash for our cars. How are you doing? Hmm? Most rural people pay cash for their cars because they've had to do it the hard way and they plan and make payments to themselves. What this is talking, I'm just putting in a little spike here, you know. Don't never judge a man by his dress or you'll end up with... Um, with, um, uh, well, no information at all. Uh, I know a car agency from not very far from here in Salem Springs, Arkansas, that I walked into the showroom, uh, showroom. I was working cattle in the morning. I still had on my jeans. I walked in, and I was going to buy two brand-new Regency Oldsmobiles. The manager and his salesman were having a meeting in a little cubicle glass. They could see me. I stood, I read the pamphlets, I waited 10 minutes, and I'm, you know, 10 minutes is my limit, and I'm out of here. And I drove to Springdale, Arkansas, and bought two brand new Regency Oldsmobiles. They never knew it. So you see, what God is saying, just so there might be an era that the city people might get a little uppity, and I'm not trying to draw class lines here, I'm just saying God knows the hearts of people and he knows who to bless and who not to bless. 
He said, I'm going to go to those that live in tents, which means rule, and I'm going to save them first. And uh, then work his way on into the uh, David and the inhabitants and the glory of Jer Jerusalem. Uh, do not magnify themselves to see that they don't magnify themselves against each other. And certainly don't think I'm magnifying myself as a country person against a city dude. Uh, it's just a choice. I prefer the country. Um, we just finished Passover in Kansas City. I wouldn't live in a city that size. I, I, you couldn't hire me to live in a place like that. Pavement, concrete, you can't see God's nature, and you've got some imitation tree set out there and pump water to it, and the poor little thing's got so much smog from cars, it looks wilted, crippled, and sick. It's wonderful in the city. Well, I'm glad that people enjoy the city. I don't, all right? And I, I don't know what, the, I guess I'm digressing. No, I'm not. The subject tense is rule, okay? Means the rule people. So I've got a right to put a plug in for rule people. Verse 8, all right? God says, I'm going to take the little people, the country people, and I'm going to save their tents first and move in. That, that is a good move for anyone that knows anything about military strategy. You always bring your outriders in first and then begin the war. Verse 8, in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of God shall be, as, I'm sorry, the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. You know why? Because the angel of the Lord will be there. And when he utilizes the symbology of David here, where a, a um, feeble person, uh, that's to say even one that is fallen, finished, kaput, will be like David. You might say, well, what does that mean? You don't remember? Little old David, a little child, and uh, Goliath, the terrible giant, is marching across the plain, and the entire army of Israel is shaking in its boots. And here this child, without armor, walks across that little valley draw toward Goliath, and intends to take him on, and it made Goliath angry that uh, a child would come after him. And of course, David takes five smooth stones. He only needed one, but five is grace, just so that we have the key to David. And David inserted that stone in his sling, and he gave the deadly wound that killed the giant, all right? It will be the same as the deadly wound of the end times. It will be flung by one as innocent as David. It would be from this event that Jesus would make the statement, statement in his ministry out of the mouths of children. If you want to know what gives you the victory and you want to know, and it, and it will work every time. If you want to know what gives you the victory on Christ saying, out of the mouths of babes, go back and find out what came out of the mouth of that babe as he marched toward Goliath. And you'll find this key to success. You'll find part of the key to David, all right? Even uh, the weakest, feeblest person will be able to react as David did to the giant. He killed him, all right? That means victory. Verse 9, in it and it shall come to pass in that day, what day? The Lord's day, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Why? King of kings, Lord of lords, there's not going to be any kingdom other than our Father's kingdom. Ten. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, unmerited favor. They don't deserve it. But he's going to give it to them anyway. And of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. 
and shalt be in bitterness for him as one in bitterness for his firstborn. Now many think right there, let's looking at him on the cross. And it was a terrible time on the cross, but he did it for you so that grace in the same five stones the boy picked up, the same grace, which is five in biblical numerics in this self-same verse, they're going to look upon the one whom they pierced, meaning they're going to pay for it. What, was, what day was this? Do you go to the time of the crucifixion to see this? No. No. You go to the day that Christ returned, and you find that day that is very plainly written in the seventh verse of the first chapter of Revelation. It's the return of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And it states very clearly there in the revelation, which means the uncovering, which you're supposed to understand, and any child can understand if they will relax and let it flow. And it stipulates there at Christ's return as they look up. Behold, he cometh with clouds. That's how he left in Acts chapter 1. And every eye, I repeat, every eye, this is Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen, and they're going to. Too late then, friend, because the purest marks are still there. But what is he riding? A white horse, not a little ass, into town. What is he carrying? Praying hands? No, a rod of iron. That's why those that pierced him will tremble because he's not coming back as a babe to be crucified when they look upon him as you behold in this 10th verse. But he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. That's why we've got the victory, all right? Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it blessed? Verse 11. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem. Oh, you can bet. What day? The Lord's day. As the morning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. Now, this is loaded, it's locked. It means you, you can read of this event in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 32, 22 rather. And um, it's when Josiah died, all right? They, they cried a lot in that valley. It was a the weep in his time, I guess, that's recorded in one of the most sad times recorded in God's Word. But what you need to know, do you know what Megiddon means? Have you ever heard of Armageddon? Armageddon is the place of the great battle around Jerusalem that we're talking about here. What happens there? Megiddo in the Hebrew tongue means the gathering place of the crowd. What crowd? Satan and his cohorts. Their gathering place. And boy, is it going to be a sad day when they look upon him that they pierced because the, the iron rod, shepherd's staff, will be put to good use. Every, there will be a lot of discipline taught in that day. And do you know something? I don't think it'll be too difficult to teach discipline because we know coming out the gate that every knee is going to bow. Every knee is going to bow. And you talk about weeping and begging. If you think they wept when Josiah died, when you see people weeping for mercy for them own, their own souls, praying for the mountains to fall on them, to cover them, do you know who part of them will be? You see, this is the destruction of Antichrist where he's cast into the pit. I'm sorry to say this, but at the present course, if there isn't a change of course in teaching, in teaching people to accept the first Messiah that appears on this earth soon to fly out of here, that's Antichrist. The Bible is very specific about that. It's the idle shepherd taught in the last chapter. 
they're going to be down in the, on their knees weeping and begging. And, and there'll be some of the fa fancy dance. Come, oh, Lord Jesus, we were deceived for a moment. Yes, we were. We were going to rapture our whole church out of here and just fly away and wave bye-bye at these other people. But you know what happened? We were deceived by that fellow there. But we love you, Lord, and we've cast out demons in your name, and we've loved and praised you and healed in your name, Lord. He's going to say, get out of my sight. Hmm? You talk about weeping and crying. Their little crown that they think they have loaded up with stars of saving people, they find out they're stars of leading people to jump in bed and play be Jezebel with Satan. It's going to get mighty heavy on their head for false teaching, for being a false prophet from God's Word when a child can understand the chronological order of events. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not out to win friends and influence people other than those that have eyes to see and ears to hear and to please Almighty God. And as long as it pleases God, this ministry will be blessed double full. And it, as it is, we don't have to beg. We don't have to borrow. God is able. But that's the time we're standing in now. So I'm sorry, you might say, well, oh, that's what my preacher. Well, hey, if the shoe fits, put it on and wear it. But do something about it. Get into God's word and study it chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you're not deceived. Because God shall remember his children. He's returning. It's not going to continue on. You're in the generation of the fig tree. And God is returning. And he's not happy with those that are not in his camp that have not repented. Verse 12. And the land shall mourn every family apart. How sharp are you? Hmm? Do you really know God's word? How sharp are you? Listen carefully. Understand this. And the land shall mourn every family apart. The family of the house of David apart. And their wives apart. Hmm. The family of the house of Nathan apart. And their wives apart. Isn't that something? Thirteen. The family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart. The family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart. Do you understand what's being done here? You just heard and you just read the lineage of Jesus Christ that key, which is recorded in the birthright of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 3. You will not read that in Matthew chapter 1, which was Joseph, Mary's husband's genealogy, because Joseph, Mary's husband's genealogy, has nothing, very little to do with the real birth of Christ, for God was the father, not Joseph. But you just read, and do you know something? Nathan would be one of the very few differences in that genealogy, but enough so that if you have the key of David, you're aware. And I know, there, I know that is not taught a great deal in this generation, and that's really sad, because many people do not know the true genealogy of Christ, that Inasmuch as Elizabeth was the cousin to Mary, the mother of Christ, which her genealogy is very important because she was the womb in which the embryo was planted of our Savior. Inasmuch as Elizabeth, as it is declared in Luke chapter 1, was a full-blood Levite, not of the tribe of Judah, but of Levi, then because she was, a, she was the wife to a practicing priest, and that was required. Then if Mary is her cousin, then it means that Mary's mother had to be of the Levitical priesthood also, meaning that tribe, that family. 
It is natural then from the genealogy given in Luke chapter 3 that Mary's father and his genealogy is important because he was the father of earthly father of Mary is given in Luke chapter 3 and the reason you don't see begats but print in English as was supposed means as by law meaning they were in laws because the genealogy in as much as Mary had no brother was passed to Joseph. But it is Mary's genealogy. You just covered it. That is the, uh, probably, probably about the third guarantee of Christ's genealogy given in the word that is traced for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. But, but why are they apart? Why, why are the wives and the husbands apart? What time is it? What day is it? It's the Lord's day. What takes place on the Lord's day? There's a wedding. And there is a change of dispensations. And the new wedding is, is that we all wed our husband, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that makes some people uncomfortable because you love your mate very much. But there's some changes coming. And you will still love them very much. But this guarantees the time element involved here. Otherwise, you know, if we were to translate this with the understanding of some, we would say, boy, there's going to be a lot of divorces on the last day. They all got to split up, don't they? Well, they're not literally split up. They can be holding hand in hand, but uh, we must always love the Lord more than family because he is the husband. This does not mean anything. Your little old flesh might be just running its little old motor overtime. Oh, dear God, what's happening? You won't have it anymore, so its little motor won't run, and you won't have anything to worry about. Verse 14 to complete. All the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart, alone. That means all tribes. Boy, that's exciting. God never takes anything away that he doesn't give us something a lot better. And when it gets better than this, how good can it get? A lot better, okay? It's going to be a wonderful time. I look forward to it. I count the days. That, and I know that we're in that generation and they have been for quite some time. But you, we must learn also to be patient because God knows when it should be. Otherwise, someone will get cut out or cut off. And we don't want that. We, we were sent here for the purpose of helping people learn truth. That's why God's election are here. To be delivered up whereby with the Holy Spirit speaking through them as it is written in Mark chapter 13 then that truth could come forward by the voice of God himself through the Holy Spirit, whereby no one could have excuse that they had not heard the truth. I feel that every one that was chosen before the foundations of this earth as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, volunteered, like it or lump it. I know sometimes when you volunteer, you almost wish you'd change your mind. But if they had already overcome, there would be no reason for them to go through this earth age without having volunteered. Now, if you don't understand what I'm saying, just put it on the shelf over here. No big deal. Praise God you're saved, all right? And let it go at that. But we have that victory. We have that victory in him, through him, and because of him. You know, when he took your spirit, and I'm sure he helped it lovingly. When the conception in your mother's womb transpired. And I'm sure he took that spirit and he probably asked a blessing over it. Having known you and what you could accomplish and placed it in that, dis in that dimension, in that embryo knowing you were going to make him proud, hoping you would make him proud 
as one of his elect, he knew you would make him proud because he'll keep correcting till he gets your attention. Sometimes for some people it takes a lot. <clears throat> but he's, he has a way of doing it. So that personal contact with him is a beautiful thing. And we look forward naturally to that day that we're with him as he is with us even now. But we have work to do and that work is to grow skilled in his word whereby we can be a better employee. And I'll tell you what, you can't be employed by a better than our Father. You think about it. Walk with him and he will walk with you. Do his work and he will fight with you. That is to say, protect you. Think about it. It's a good way to be. What a book, this Zechariah. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?